topic is uh, Norway 1938 to 40, and that's uh, mainly because you can't really talk about World War II and the German attack without starting, you know, without starting a little bit before the war. Um, the roots to what happened, at least on the Norwegian side, also go back to World War I. <clears throat> In 1905, when Norway and uh, Sweden split, Norway was probably the best armed it had been uh, until fairly recent time. Uh, NATO, etc. And uh, but it kind of lapsed after that. Of course, Norway at the turn of the century was not a wealthy nation. So um, over the years, it was maintained, and then World War One came. And World War One, as most of you I'm sure know, Norway was not a participant. But still, there was quite a few Norwegians who died. A lot of seamen, a lot of ships went down, were sunk, and. Uh, there was also uh, volunteers from Norway on both sides, actually, most of them on the Allied side. Um, the aftermath of World War I was, of course, an enormous shock in Europe. I mean, some 10 million young men had died. And for example, out of the uh, people who were born in the late last part of the 19th century in, in, uh, in France between 1890 and 1900, 60% of them were either killed or permanently quote, quote, unquote, damaged in one way or another, which is, is a phenomenal amount of uh, young people. So um, actually, I think one of you have a radio on, so maybe if you mute your, I don't know who it is, but I hear somebody has that, or uh, TV maybe. Mm. So, um, so uh, the impact <clears> or <throat> oh, uh, World War One was also felt in Scandinavia, even though Scandinavia had been outside the conflict. Okay, and, and there was a big, uh, there was a tremendous you don't anti- want to watch this. How can I watch it? I'm not watching anything. You gotta watch it here. No, I'm not watching it like this. <laughs> so um, the anti-war feeling was quite strong all over Scandinavia. Oh, so, you know, it was, and of course, everybody talked about the war to end war, which we all know, of course, didn't happen. Uh, in Norway, you had something called the broken gun or the broken rifle, and it was a peace movement. I was, you know, we shouldn't spend any money on uh, military, and uh, even though they never, that never happened. Um, and uh, then, of course, there was a, the recession in 1929. There was still very little done for the military. So, to a certain extent, the Norwegian military in 1940 was the same it had been in 1917, with a couple of exceptions. One was, of course, airplanes. <clears throat> and the other thing was that the Norwegian army was actually quite well supplied with machine guns. Uh, but there were some problems. And one of them was they had two types. And no military uh, maneuvers were held in Norway say, in the 30s. And even I think there was something like one in the 20s, maybe in one in the 30s. Too, but there, there was hardly anything. So. Uh, the Norwegian soldiers were not trained to use this and they couldn't use, uh, you know, they mixed up the, the ammunition. It was all sorts of blunders or, or problems. And a lot of them stemmed from that simple fact. So uh, when Hitler came to power and uh, after a short time afterwards, <clears throat> it became quite clear that his uh, foreign policy was uh, fairly aggressive, to, to use a nice word. And Towards the latter half of the 30s, everybody started to rearm in Europe, and including Norway, Norway, Sweden. Um, again, I think unless I, I will, um, I will open for comments, etc., and then uh, you can unmute. But it's probably easier for everybody if the mute button is on, um, unless you're you're talking or asking something. So. <clears throat> The, um, the problem, of course, was that uh, there were three types. There was the ships, there was the army equipment, and the airplanes. And especially airplanes was in short supply. It was very difficult to get. Uh, they tried to buy from Europe. Uh, the only thing uh, the Norwegian Air Force could get was some old Gloucester Gladiator double-deckers, which were actually fairly new, but they were totally outmoded. It was uh, the last double-deckers that we used. and. Uh, the only reason they bought them and <clears throat> they were built was really that uh, they had to fill in the numbers and they needed some planes. They, they then went to the US and ordered a fairly good amount of modern equipment. And I will get back to that uh, 
And it's a good what if, if uh, that had been ordered earlier or the Germans had attacked six months later. For example, the fighter planes, uh, quite a few of them had arrived in Norway, but they had not been, they were still being assembled and didn't have any guns. So uh, they were just sitting there and the, this were Curtis uh, Hawk fighters and uh, the uh, Germans actually gave them to the uh, Finns, but they did very good service against the Russian Air Force. All right, before we, um, once uh, the, uh, the Germans decided, or Hitler, I should say, Hitler decided to attack Scandinavia, he, his main reason was, it was actually the German Navy who pushed most for it. Uh, who pushed for it the most. Um, I don't think it's my, okay. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Oh yeah, so. Uh, the German Navy was the biggest pressure. We always hear about the, the uh, iron ore from Sweden. Yes, that was a consideration, but they could have gotten that anyway. Uh, the big thing was uh, the German Navy was afraid of being bottled up as they had been in World War I when they basically spent the war in uh, Ludwigshafen in, in Northern Germany. Of course, this was before France had fallen. So there was a fairly short coastline and the, the British Navy was several times bigger than, uh, than the German Navy. So they pushed hard for it. There was also, of course, the idea about iron ore and Hitler also had this idea that the Allies could attack him via Norway, which it's probably some truth in that, but that would have, would have meant that uh, the Allies would have had to attack Norway first and conquer it. So, um, but you know, <laughs> so, I, I guess if you try to figure out all Hitler's motives, you, you would uh, spend an awful long time and uh, get very few results. So when he finally decided it, he called in uh, Nikolai von Falkenhorst, whose uh, original name was Strzepski or something like that. I can't pronounce Polish names, but of course in, uh, in uh, the... Uh, Third Reich uh, Germany, uh, he wanted something more uh, Germanic sounding. So he actually changed his name to Falkenhorst, but he was a very competent officer. So he was told to plan for the attack. And this was in January or February, something very short time. And um, the first thing he did was to go out and buy a map of Norway because he had never, he had been to Finland, which may have been one of the reasons he was chosen. He had some no knowledge about Scandinavia, but he had never been to Norway. So we used this uh, map to plan the invasion and it was a very daring, extremely daring invasion. It could very easily have gone wrong. Uh, who dares win as they say, but they had, um, the, the German air force and the German army was probably the best in Europe at the time. I, I think we can see almost, it was certainly the best in Europe. Actually it was probably the best in the world. The German Navy, on the other hand, was had some modern ships, but it was very small. They, they would not have been able to fight the Royal Navy in a big naval battle. So they had to stay close to the coast. And Norway, of course, as we all know, has a coastline. You can't go to Norway unless you go to, well, you can go to Russia, but that's a heck of a long way. Or you can go to Sweden. But even Sweden, of course, you have to tr cross water from Denmark, even though that's a very narrow strait. So if uh, the, the uh, unless they could establish bases and get the soldiers into Norway fairly quickly, they wouldn't be able to succeed. And um, you can say the Germans had an excellent air force, but their best fighter, the, the one area where they really had a world beater was the Messerschmitt 109, a single engine fighter, that couldn't reach Norway. Because remember, it's much further from Denmark to Norway than it is from, uh, England to, uh, to, from France to England. And during Battle of Britain, the, the German fighters only had 10 minutes of fuel over London before they had to return, which was one of the reasons, of course, the Battle of Britain went the way it did because the fighters couldn't stay there and the bombers, uh, as we all know, became very easy prey for the fighters. So it was a daring operation and, um, but Hitler went along and, uh, we will talk about that next. First, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about the people involved in, in the uh, invasion and also some of the equipment that was used. Uh, 
So if you go to the next uh, slide. So these are some of the commanders that were the, uh, the main characters. Now, top left is uh, General Fleischer, and uh, he was head of the uh, infantry re regiment, as they called them back then, in uh, Northern Norway, which was the most modern and best equipped unit, because the fear in Norway at the time, until short time before Hitler attack, was Russia which is not so strange because Russia had just fought a war, of course, tried to conquer Finland. And uh, we are very close to Finland. So the, the unit was stationed there. Well, in hindsight, we can say it was a mistake, but at the time, it, it's a very understandable mistake. The, the center guy is Otto Ruge, General Otto Ruge. He was actually, Colonel, he was um, not the head of the Norwegian army, but the guy who was General Lok was quite old. Uh, by the standards of the day in his well into his 60s. And uh, it was quite clear that he didn't have the energy really to fight the war. He, he, he wasn't, a, he's often been blamed, of course, you know, oh, he was too old, so on. But he was actually the one who gave the Norwegian Air Force uh, orders that they could fire on enemy planes or foreign planes coming into Norwegian territory. So he, he did set up some of the re things that did benefit us when uh, when April uh, struck. The next guy, the top right, is um, uh, General Pellengar, and he was head of the 196th German Infantry Division, and that was the the division that was tasked with taking Oslo and capturing the king and uh, king and the government and all that stuff, and actually pursued him all the way up to all. So he again, he was a very competent officer and. Uh, was um, actually went back to Norway many times after the war to visit. And uh, he had not been, as far as we know, he had not been involved in any of the atrocities. So uh, he was an old school uh, officer, I think. But still, in the 50s, uh, to show up in the regional hotels, and he signed his name, General Pellengar, uh, <laughs> must have uh, been quite a, um, it must have been some interesting reactions from some of the people. So, Bottom left is uh, Norway's most controversial uh, officer because he was a member of NS or the National Socialist Party. And he um, was head of the uh, army groups in, uh, or the army detachments in Narvik, which of course was the other. Oslo was the one big target, the other one was Narvik. There were five different invasion points. We'll to take a look at that. And he pretty much surrendered. And it was a lot of talk about. Uh, um, being a traitor, and he he was sentenced as a traitor later, but he, not for his actions in 1940, because the court actually said that you know with there was no clear orders from anybody, there was a lot of chaos. He he couldn't really be uh, be sentenced for that, and I think it also had, was a little bit of politics in those things because there was quite a few officers who, who uh, of course. You know, they had no orders to resist. They had, uh, yeah. So um, he didn't, what he did wasn't that different from what some of the other officers did. But of course, it was more serious because it was Narvik. And then the, the bottom center is uh, Falkenhorst, which I just talked about. And again, he was very competent officer. He was, he was uh, in trouble after the war. And that was for some of the things that happened during his tenure as the Supreme Commander in Norway, but uh, he didn't send. He wasn't sent for, for very much. I, I think it had a lot to do with uh, that. Uh, a lot of the what happened had uh, was not so much the German army as uh, you know the some of these uh, Gestapo and figures that were in charge on Terboff and the most uh, famous, of course, and uh, probably the most hated the man in Norwegian history. And bottom right is uh, Colonel Eriksen, who was the head of the gar garrison and the fortress of Oskarsborg, which of course was an extremely important, uh, probably the most important battle in Norwegian history, at least in modern times. So these are some of the people we will get back to. So if we could jump to the next slide. All right, so this is the Norwegian Air Force in 1940. Uh, top left is the Gloucester Gladiator. They bought 12, 
Uh, three of them had been written off in accidents, etc. So there were nine, but two of them were being serviced. So seven of them were at Oslo airport. And that was the only fighter detachment in Norway. Uh, they took off, they actually managed to shoot down five planes, uh, considering the age uh, of the plane that they could hardly keep up with the German bombers. It was not a bad uh, result, but of course, it didn't really amount to much, except it slowed down the occupation, just like Oskar Sporg, we often forget that. So the German, a lot of the German uh, transport planes were ordered to return because they would have been helpless, even against the Gloucester Gladiator, the Junker 52 and so on. Well, you know, it's, it's a good transport plane, but all tra most transport planes, especially in those days, were very slow, very easy prey for, uh, for fighters. So um, that also delayed the occupation of Oslo. The top right is a German plane, a Heinkel 115, and that was the most modern plane in Norwegian, uh, Norwegian armory. There were six of them operational and uh, uh, one was lost. Uh, one flew to, to uh, ended up after the fighting up in Finland and the three of them went to England and we used, uh, at least one or two of them were used for clandestine operations because it was German. They, Brits just overpainted them with German markings that could use them, uh, use them in the Mediterranean, I think around Malta to, to you know, deceive the enemy obviously. Top, uh, sorry, bottom left, uh, Fokkers, that's the main, most uh, numerous plane in Norway and um, was an observation plan. Not a bad plane, but again, you know, 10 years too old probably. And of course, in the 30s, late from 1930 to 1940, the development, especially in aviation, was phenomenal. I mean, the planes in 1930 and the planes in 1940 were world apart, almost like the difference when you saw um, the propeller planes being replaced by jets. Um, they, were, they were quite useful, especially in Northern Norway, because there were no airports there and they uh, could la land and take off on skis. So uh, in the battles around the Narvik, the Luftwaffe uh, didn't really make that much impact because the distances in uh, Northern Norway, as everybody has been there, no, it's, uh, they are very, they are vast distances. And remember the planes, the Germans had the short distance bombers, you know, they were meant for supporting uh, ground troops. They were not really meant for bombing faraway cities and targets. Uh, the only time they tried to do that was in the Battle of Britain and, and we saw that how that ended. The bottom right is uh, interesting because that's one of the 30 MF-11 and uh, that's the only combat plane produced in Norway in any number. There were a few of Tests, but they have built about 30 of them. Again, when they came out in the 20s, it was a very good design. Uh, in 1940, they were uh, used for observation, and uh, but they couldn't. They were they couldn't really fight anymore. They couldn't, you know, to use them and attack German ships, etc. They would be cut to pieces by anti-aircraft. They were too slow and so on. But it was a good design. Uh, from the well, I'll get back to that actually in the next slide. So these were the planes we had. And as you heard, the numbers were small. I mean, there was uh, some 20 MF-11 and 30 Fokker CVDs, but they were observation plans and they did, did a useful job and flew to the end of the campaign. It was two months, of course. And um, some of them, uh, the MF-11, of course, I was a member of the Norwegian Air Historical Society, partly because my dad was in the Air Force for from 1946 to 56, so 10 years. and. Uh, um, after the war, the Finns asked Norwegian Air Force they wanted to have one of them back because, and uh, they said, no, oh yeah, nobody thought about that. But of course, every an air enthusiast in Norway is crying when they hear about that today because it's our only really useful plane that, that had actually been used in, in combat. So, all right, that was a little digression. I, I have a few of those, uh, just bear with me. All right, shall we go to the next slide? Now, one of the things I always uh, enjoy with reading history and learning about history is a little bit sort of what if, I mean, not make, taking it too far, but these are the aircraft on orders. And if you see top left is a Douglas A8, one engine bomber, and it was a good design. And in 1940, it would have been very useful in Norway because as I mentioned, the, the main reason is that the Messerschmitt 109 couldn't reach the battle areas un until they built, uh, they got bases, which they of course did in a few days. But if they had been stopped before they came across, they would have been, 
they would have been slaughtered if, if these things had been uh, operational. Because the Germans had very few ships. Every ship had to go four times back and forth just to bring the initial uh, invasion fleet. So, of course, if you had bombers flying around. The top right is uh, Caproni, an Italian bomber. Now, that was one of four that was delivered. And it was called the Clipfisk. Uh, it's a herring type. It's a, you know, if you see them in Norway, Norway sort of hanging down, that's Clipfisk. And the... Um, sorry, Koda, I think it is. Um, and they were actually traded for fish. So that's why they were called the fish bombers, so the uh, herring. So they bought four of them and then they got a, uh, ordered another 10 and then got a uh, license to build for, of an improved version. But um, unfortunately, that never happened. So it was only the four and they were at Stavanger Airport and they were destroyed the first attack actually. And in the 70s, when I was a member of this Norwegian historical group, there was, of course, a lot of pilots. And one of the pilots that flew one of those things, uh, uh, those planes, uh, was a member. And he, he was trying to take off, but the bomb knocked them off. So they fortunately they survived, obviously, but uh, they never really got into the fight, which, of course, was very was too bad from his point of view. And then the bottom is the um, Hawk 75. And 60 of them were on order, and something I think was about 20 had re, uh, arrived in Norway. <clears throat> and this is one of those that were, had already been assembled. But as you can see, there should you would see the gun pointing out to the wing if they had been ready for fight, but that, that wasn't the case. And as I said, the Germans gave them to the Finnish Air Force uh, afterwards. But 60 of those would have been perfect. Now, the way the Germans operated, they had the bombers and the uh, the transport. And then they had this mess this twin engine Messerschmitt 110 or 110 as an escort fighter. But the problem with that was that it was useless as an escort fighter. So uh, they found that in the Battle of Britain, they had to actually, the escort had to be escorted by single engine fighters. So the, 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 they would have been in real trouble, I think, the invasion force, at least the Air Force, if these planes had been operational. All right, so we go to the next one. The next uh, slide, um, sorry. So this is the opposition. Uh, the top left is actually a Heinkel 111 over Norwegian mountains. Um, that's a twin engine bomber. It's mostly famous from World War II. It was a good bomber by 30 standards. Um, took a reasonable, you know, it was reliable. But it was an easy prey for fight, which most bombers of the time were. That goes for British, French, American, they, they were. Uh, next over is, of course, the, probably the most famous plane from World War II, the Stuka, which uh, they used quite a few. And <coughs> this is pretty especially troublesome for the British Navy. Uh, it's not so easy to bomb narrow valleys like you have in Norway, because a Stuka has to pull up. And if you have a target between two uh, mountains uh, that could be a uh, you, you can really only go in one way so um, uh, it was useful of course and psychologically but it wasn't as important in Norway as it was in uh, in Poland and the low countries where they had a freer uh, operation bottom left is the one I just talked about the message with 110 that's a model I I still enjoy building models <laughs> uh, and um, that's uh, uh, as I said, it it was again a decent design, but by 1940 it was a twin engine fighters, except as night fighters, were generally a flop in in World War II. Even the P-38 Lightning, for those who are interested in that side, uh, had trouble fighting the single engine fighters. And then the bottom right is the uh, Junker 52. Now this is from a Norwegian fjord, and uh, they landed the 1050 of them, and um, this was April, so of course that's springtime, and they couldn't take off. They never took off again. So they went through the ice and disappeared there. And one of them was raced after the war, and uh, just by Oslo Airport Gardermoen, for those who've been there, there's a Norwegian Air Force Museum is in that area. <clears throat> and they have one of those. Uh, I don't think it's the one you see there, but that I don't know. But, uh, but it's one of those that fell through the ice there. And that was raced and refurbished, and it's quite a beautiful uh, restoration they did. So that was the opposition. Okay, shall we take the next slide? 
So this is the navy. Now, <clears throat> top left is Blücher and bottom right is Oskarsborg. So we'll get back to that. Uh, Blücher was the biggest warship uh, that was was in fight with Norwegian land batteries. There were a couple of battleships, but they didn't enter the fjords. Top right is Norway's most modern ship of any size, Olaf Trygg, was some which was based in Horten and had a running battle with a couple of German, uh, um, well, they were basically mine hunters, etc. but they're fairly fast and had armament and uh, one of them was sunk and the other damaged. And the ship had problems because they, they were hit by quite a few uh, bullets, so they had to ban the ship, and the Germans actually used it until, and it was sunk, I believe, by British bombers in 1944 or something. So it was a good design. The bottom left are the two Panzer sheep or armored battleships. Uh, coastal battleships is what they called as a class. That was a class of ships from the 19 uh, around 1900. Uh, by 1940, I think the moment you had planes and torpedoes, etc., they were, because they were basically cruisers sized, but very heavy armor and heavy uh, and heavy uh, armament. But since they were small, that meant they were very slow because they had to have a small engine to give room for all that. Um, they had short range because, again, you know, it's small space, and when you shortcut, you had to cut out something. So they had. They were, that's why they called coastal battleships. And they were all, in 1914, they would have been good because, or could still have been useful because, you know, the torpedoes were not that advanced in World War II, uh, World War One, sorry. And of course, planes were not really a big threat in, in World War One, not for ships anyway, but uh, by World War II standards, they, they shouldn't, they should have been, uh, they should have been uh, written off before. There were four of them, so two of them had already been scrapped, actually. But uh, they were sunk in, in minutes, unfortunately. And of course, uh, it was the biggest no individual Norwegian loss on that day was those two ships. This is taken just two days before. It looks very peaceful. So strange to think that two days later, they went down with uh, several hundred men. So it was it was too bad, but you know that's uh, that is war, of course. And then the... Oskarsborg a fortress to the right shows how narrow the fjord is in when you go into Oslo. <clears throat> and I had sailboat for seven years when I lived in Norway, actually until I moved to California in 84. And when you sailed into behind the, the picture there, uh, which is where Blücher sunk because it was sunk by the fortress, but it was gliding past it and then finally went down. And it was leaking oil for 30 years after the war. So in the 70s and 80s, or very early 80s, I sold the boat in 83, but in 70, you could still see oil seeping up. Not much, but it was, it was enough to be noticeable. And I think it was in uh, 10 or 20 years later that they actually, uh, uh, Norwegian government finally sent, uh, you know, remote uh, divers or whatever they did and uh, pumped out because it had something like a thousand tons of oil. And as long as it was just a little bit, it didn't problem. But they, of course, they got more and more nervous that suddenly something major could collapse and you would have a thousand tons uh, uh, up in a very narrow fjord and a big, uh, you know, for area for vacationers and what have you. All right, shall we go to the next slide? So this is uh, some of the other ships. Uh, the top two are two German cruisers. <coughs> they had... Uh, uh, the German Navy had, didn't have a lot of cruisers. They had uh, in total nine. There were three heavy cruisers and six uh, light cruisers. Now in 1940, only two of the heavy cruisers were in the service. Uh, uh, the other one was uh, uh, it was Graf Speer who sailed with uh, with uh, Bismarck, um, which is quite probably most famous for that. The the middle left picture is Sleipner. And that's one of the, that, those are the most modern warships in Norwegian service. The one I mentioned earlier was after all built as partly as a training ship and partly as a, as a uh, mine layer. But these were destroyers and they were quite good. They were only about six, 700 tons. So by today's standards, they would barely qualify as a Corvette. But uh, in those days, that was a destroyer. The bottom two are the Germans uh, C-class destroyers, which are two and a half thousand tons. So. Each of them was about four times the weight of the Norwegian destroyer. And uh, that was uh, one of the biggest losses the Germans had. And I will get back to that. All right, so we can uh, take next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, this we can we can just pass this. This just shows the list of the Norwegian ships, and they had about fifty eight. There's they something like hundred and five ships the Norwegian Navy, but uh, there was only a few destroyers. <clears throat> was the two capital ships, which are about four thousand tons, as you can see there. There's a lot of observation ships. There were some old submarines. Some of it was okay, but I think the Navy hasn't. It's not really much written about that part, but. I think it was some of the same as for the Air Force. There, there hadn't really been any good maneuvers, you know, practice training, because for, they were afraid that that would uh, be uh, sort of tempting the Germans to do something. I don't think uh, now, of course, it's easy to say that I don't think you had to tempt Hitler with anything. He would just do whatever he wanted to do till he lost. All right, so let's go to the next one. Next slide. All right, that's just the typical Norwegian army uniforms. They were nothing special. The top bottom right is a, the king's guard um the top right picture oh and the, the the guy at the top he has a general's uniform a colonel or a general i think he's a general since it's gold top right is uh this this three the three only three modern motor torpedo boat now the word it's another good little qu trivia question the world's first motor torpedo boat or mtb was norwegian was built in Norwegian specifications by Tony Croft in England. And in the um, 20s, these three were, uh, were landed. And all three of them had interesting careers during uh, the invasion. Um, one of them was sunk and raced. One had a running fight with two German ships. And uh, it actually ended up exploding. But they managed, the crew managed to get off just before it exploded. So most of them survived. So that was a good thing, of course. The bottom right is from uh, Hegra Fortress, which is one of the more, more famous uh, battle uh, places in Norway. It's a fortress by Trondheim. It was built to stop the Germans, sorry, the Swedes from cutting Norway in two originally. Then it was maintained that most of these border fortresses were closed after Norway and Sweden had a, a good breakup in their relationship, good divorce in 1905. But that one was kept because it was felt that if the German, if the Russians ever attack, you would need the place to stop them. And Norway is quite narrow at that that uh, place. And it's also a long, long uh, way for the Russians to bring supplies. And Nor Northern Norway is very, especially in those days, even today, it's very thinly populated. So that was, um, and that fortress, uh, was, uh, well, they did a very good job, as we'll talk about later. All right, so this is a little of the background. Uh, before I go to um, the, uh, the next slide, uh, which is actually shows the German invasion points. If there's any questions, we can take a few questions now. Nothing? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, okay. it took me a while to unmute. Yeah, I'm just sort of looking at like, um, just to get an idea, a, a 200 millimeter shell, that's going to be about um, six inches or so. That's a uh, rel relatively small shell for a, a, a compared to say like a, a Missouri class battleship. Yeah, the, the, um, the, the guns at Akashus were much bigger though. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but the others, they, most of these ships have smaller, and that one, of course, is a land based gun. That's correct. It's, uh, of course, the Missouri came, you know, 10 years or many years later. So, sorry, yeah. not 10 years. Uh, yeah. But the 10 years after these sh other ships were built. So. so, so this would be by, like, say, late World War II standards, uh, this would be a fairly small shell. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, of course, during wartime, uh, technological development, especially military affairs, of course, advances enormously. When we look at the tanks that we used in 1940 and the tanks that we used in 1945, I mean, they, they, yeah. they, if you got one of those old ones, the best thing would be to jump out and run. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even be able to penetrate the, the armor or anything else. And that okay. goes also, I mean, the planes, of course, the speeds, it is just, between 1940 and 45, there, there's almost every aspect of warfare changed completely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, we can jump to the next uh, slide. Now, this is the 
invasion points and um, maybe you can make it a little bit bigger yeah so this showed the, the invasion points now the two most important and I, i'm not going to go to all of them but uh, just the most important you have uh, the two you know on the very sun christian sun etc um there was some fighting there the, the uh, christian sun fortress uh, actually managed to sink a german freighter so uh, but unfortunately in the days before april 9th which just shows how little um, how most norwegians didn't really think anything would happen most of the crews had been sent home because they wanted to save money because it's expensive to keep all the fortresses uh, manned so uh, they only had a quarter of their complements so in both Oskarsborg and uh, uh, these other fortresses, uh, quite been uh, most important in Bergen, and then of course you had uh, the outer Oslo Fjord, etc. All these places, um, they were all under man. They couldn't use all their guns. But um, it, almost all of these towns had uh, had uh, uh, fortresses protecting the harbors, which was a big thing. And the Norwegian coast. Uh, coastal artillery it was in use until fairly recent time actually it's only with smart bombs that uh, you know once you have smart bombs these uh, fixed installations become more or less useless so today of course Norwegian coastal defense is based on mobility you know you you haul in a hellfire rocket or something like that but if you put it there three months with a big fence around everybody would know it so you can't do that so it's but that was not the case in 1940 now the two uh, the uh, we can we can start in Oslo. So Oslo was, of course, the main target. Um, Hitler was always very aware of propaganda and things like that. So he um, he saw it as very important to capture the king and the government and all the state functions, which which it would have been if they had managed to do that. I think it would have been a different story. I, I don't think the they'd probably be more like in Denmark, <clears throat> where initially folk art were just shocked, and then resistance started after a short time but of course because in Norway you had the government managed to escape and of course it's uh, as you well this is a good size uh, difference when you look at Norway and Denmark you see the map um, that was not the case you know so so that was of course the most important thing now when they came up and I don't know if any of see have seen the king's choice it's actually an excellent movie um, it's usually available on Netflix you know they sort of come and go there but it's it tells very well about the uh, the um the fortress and how it they've decided to shoot and uh, but when they finally got that far they had passed two other fortresses out Ravon uh, was one of them and it was the biggest but it was the germans were also very lucky with the weather on april 9th because it was very foggy so there were some shots were fired from Ravon and the other one uh, the other fortress and um, but they they there was just a couple of shots it was so foggy they didn't find the distance and they disappeared in the fog again and the germans never returned fire and which was probably a smart thing because of course that left a little bit of a sort of an easy feeling did we fire what did we fire at um so when they came and uh, so they were they were warned and there was also a small norwegian coastal ship uh, observation ship called pool pol which is like polar, it's uh, um, in English. So the pool tree uh, was the one and uh, they actually started firing and was sunk. And the captain, the crew survived, but the captain passed or was killed, Wilding uh, Olsen. And he was the first Norwegian who, who died on April 9th. And in fact, World War II from Norway. So then they continued up the fjord and they had the two cruiser and they, uh, sort of a battleship cruiser um, was the one Lützow and then of course Blücher who was a 16,000 ton cruiser so it was a very big cruiser very modern it was the maiden voyage they came in with dark you know running dark and silent and uh, hoping that uh, Oskar Sporg would not fire at them but that was not the case so Oberst Eriksen was asked by his second shall we fire and you know he's uh, yeah God damn it, we're gonna fire, you know. Nobody, no, nobody with good intentions would come with a blacked out ship. So they had these two huge, uh, I think it would be almost uh, 14 inch guns or 16 inch guns. Uh, they've only fired one bullet each again, you know, they're 
complement was was reduced. It was uh, limited how many uh, uh, how, what they could do with the, that uh, with the, such a small crew, but they hit, and they also had a lot of smaller guns. So Brücher was sunk, and um, more than a thousand um, Germans died in Brücher, and a lot of them were the soldiers that were actually tasked with taking the parliament and the castle. So they ended up at the bottom of the Austro fjord, and uh, Lützow, the the other capital ship, was damaged, so they had to turn around and go out the fjord. So that was why the king and the government had time to disappear, to, to escape. And then, as I mentioned, also the, the airport. Now, the, the airport, uh, the soldiers there was, of course, much a smaller force. So we don't know how su su successful they would have been by their own. But of course, the best thing was that they, <laughs> by the time they did land, it was too late and there was a very small group. So um, Blücher was, and we, Colonel Erik Sniss, of course, uh, I think is the most important battle in, in at least modern Norwegian history. If it would have changed a lot of things if he had not uh, been so brave as to, to fire. The next one are two smaller uh, places, and uh, we can just sort of, Christian Sun, as I mentioned, but uh, the other one of interest is uh, Bergen. And again, they went in with an older cruiser, much smaller. And there was a fight with Quarven Fortress, which it's a nice place to walk. Actually, it's a beautiful area if you're in Bergen and you want to go out on the island there. Uh, Quarven Fortress was, um, they had smaller end, smaller guns, much smaller guns actually, but modern and, and strong enough to kill, to, to sink a cruiser a bat, against a battleship. I think it would have been tough going, but so they damaged uh, the German uh, Königsberg, it was the name. It was one of the ones we looked at earlier when I said these two older cruisers. And it was uh, lying very deep in the water. And um, the next day, when the British fleet was uh, getting within, you know, everybody realized what had happened, um, they sent some dive bombers and uh, Königsberg became the, had the honor of being the first battleship sunk by airplanes in World War II. After the war, there was some criticism of, you know, because how successful the fortress in outside Oslo were and how unsuc relatively unsuccessful the, uh, the fortresses in Bergen were. But of course, it Oslo is so narrow, you know, even in fog, you can't pass there. I mean, even with a sailboat, you have to be careful actually, because if you had to, if you're going against the wind and had to go sort of back and forth, you have very little room and you couldn't go, you had to go on the right-hand side and that's where they had torpedo batteries. And that was one of the things that the German military had forgotten or hadn't discovered was that there were torpedo batteries. So first they were hit by two huge grenades produced in 1898. And then they were hit by torpedoes produced in 1905. But at such a short distance, you know, you couldn't miss. It probably wouldn't have been possible to miss. So it was very, very successful and it delayed the attack. And then the following day, the Germans came back. They landed troops to go around and attack from the land side. And uh, they um, could also bombard it. Of course, they sent in bombing uh, bombers, but uh, Heinkel 111s, as we saw earlier, <coughs> But they didn't really uh, do much damage. But of course, the, the, it was a hopeless fight, so they surrendered. Um, moving there up to Trondheim, and my father—that's where my dad was from—and he told me how they, you know, they heard all these things happening, and they went out and they looked out, and there were these—they knew they were not Norwegian, even before they could see the flag, because Nor Norwegian navy didn't have anything as big as these cruisers and uh, these smaller battleships that the German navy had. So they were anchored there, and he said it was quite a quite a shock, and he he's always remembered that. Um, there were there were no there was not much fighting again because they sailed past in the fog. They they didn't even discover the ships, you know, even though they were on the alert. Uh, but then they started disembarking uh, troops, and uh, I mentioned Hegra Fortress, and just to the right of that arrow pointing at Trondheim in the middle, you see Hegra Fortress. But fortunately, it took them some time to disembark and get everything ready. So the Norwegian area commander, he moved troops into Hegra Fortress and you know, fixed it up, so to say, made it ready for battle. And uh, 
So by the time the Germans tried started moving, Hegra Fortress was already blocking some of the roads going north. And then the other one, the, so I started with Oslo and the next, the biggest, the other big target was Narvik. And um, they sent in some battleships, but battleships are too big to use in the fjord. So they turned around, the German battleship never went in. But they sent in their, their um, uh, destroyers, and this was the so-called Z-class. And 2,500 ton destroyers were very large in 1940. Today, of course, the destroyer and the frigate is six to 7,000 tons. But back then, a 2,500 ton destroyer was very considered very big. At the end of the war, um, the US Navy and the British Navy started having destroyers in that size, but really in 1940, it was very few. And the Germans only had 20 of them, and they sent 10 of them in there. They managed to surprise uh, the defenders, and as I mentioned, uh, our most famous uh, or infamous uh, uh, commander uh, surrendered the city almost immediately. But then they moved troops from Northern Norway down South. And then of course the, the British and the French uh, decided to, or came to help. And in the beginning, people thought they would been, it has to be remembered uh, today when what we know, it, it seems kind of like how could, what, how, what were they thinking about? But after all, only it was only 18 or 20 years before that the, uh, or 22 years actually, the uh, German army had been defeated by the British and French armies. And uh, so why not again, you know, so they, they, everybody in Norway and uh, probably also <laughs> in England thought that this would, could really be the, the tipping point, you know, now we can kick them. And I think we all discovered or everybody discovered on all sides that the German army in 1940 was very superior to any other army at the time. And it took some time before other armies caught up. I mean, every army that faced Germany in World War II started by being defeated, including the US Army when they first met them in Africa. They were, they were very professional and so on. So, um, and they never really had, there were very few times where they, where they were, they can be, it used to be so famous, oh, they had so many tanks and so many planes, but that was not really the case. If you look in 1940 in the battles in, in Europe, um, the French and the British had more planes and more uh, tanks than, uh, than Germans had, but it was the way they used them. And somewhat to the same in, in Norway, of course. It was a very daring operation. And uh, if the resistance had been able to start or had been better prepared and had been better equipped, it could have been, uh, I, I think it could have been very difficult for them. Okay, so uh, we can go to the next uh, slide then. So these are some of the famous pictures. Now, top left is Brüchel sinking just outside Drabak or a little bit further in actually. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's a pretty big ship in a narrow fjord. So that was, uh, that was the end of that. And uh, um, yeah, top right is a French tank. So the French brought, army brought some tanks and uh, they were fight, fighting a, a retreat all the way up to Gubranstalen and all the way over to Aldersund. And they were, they were constantly uh, being chased out by the Germans. And of course, in no, no, Southern Norway, there were some air bases and some airs they could use for the Luftwaffe. So they had air superiority. In Narvik, it was different because, and the top, the bottom right is from Narvik Harbor. So it wasn't only the, the sh naval ships that were sunk, just about every ship in the harbor was sunk or damaged. So in the fighting, so the Germans were actually pressed out and they were forced south and that was a combined Norwegian, uh, French and the British operation. Uh, they, they outnumbered the Germans four to one. So the fact that they, they, should, they should have been able to win them. But it was a psychological point because actually the first time the Germans had to move out of a, a town they had occupied. And they were driven up to a place called Björnefjell, which is right on the Swedish border. And they were dressed about to, the German troops had just been told that, you know, don't turn into Norwegians, go over to, to Sweden and surrender to the Swedes. And then of course, uh, the, the British uh, chiefs decided to pull out of Norway. And it, it was the right decision, even though Norwegians felt betrayed at the time, of course, because there's no way, I mean, 
with southern Norway in the German hands, the Germans could bring in as many um, troops as they wanted. And at that stage, there was 140,000 German troops in Norway, and there were 30,000 British and some, some of the, about 50,000 Norwegian. But of course, the Germans had the initiative, and they had air superiority, and uh, there was nothing that could stop that. So it, it was a it was quite a blow, of course, for Norwegian morale. But most of the troops, that, at least the ones that could get away, did get away to England, uh, the government, and so on. So uh, it was still a it, it was a sad decision, probably the only one that could have been made. Um, to the left, the two left bottom, uh, is that uh, one of those Norwegian, is, is a German, uh, um, what were they called them? Um, I can't remember the German name for it now, but uh, they were sort of used for all sorts of military tasks. They were armed and they were the ones who fought that. Uh, and that's the same ship before and after the fight with that uh, Norwegian uh, training ship. Uh, so there was not much left of it. There were two of them. The other one survived the fight, but it was quite damaged. I don't know if it was ever used again, but uh, this one, R-17, um, it was called, was completely destroyed. The, um, I don't have any pictures of them, but the other big fight, apart from Narvik, where we actually managed to push the Germans out, the other big fight was um, in, uh, in uh, Hegra Fortress. And he Hegra Fortress, held out for about two weeks. And that, that was, um, was quite an accomplishment because they, they were heavily bombarded. They were bombed, but the fortress had been, was very well constructed, even though it was old. A sad sort of side note is that a lot of the soldiers had big problems later on because it was so uh, muggy. And of course, today we always talk about black, uh, um, black uh, moss and so on. Uh, and they probably had tons of that. So many of them had problems with their, with, especially with their lungs, etc. later on in life. Uh, but they held out for two weeks and it was only when uh, they heard that uh, Bergen and uh, Trondheim both gave up f f fighting and uh, uh, the government was giving that they, they surrendered. So um, it was a big point. For, for a long time after the war, there was this rumor that thousands of German soldiers died there, but that was not the case. They, there were fairly few Norwegians actually died because, again, they, it was well protected and very well built. But um, we, we don't know exactly how many Germans were killed, but it wasn't that many. But it was probably a few dozens or something like that. It's, we'll probably never find out because the German records are, we know very closely how many German soldiers fell in Norway or in Scandinavia, but we don't know where. We don't know how many of them fell in Denmark, for example. It's, Again, the original is that oh, hundreds of German soldiers died in the fighting in Denmark, which only lasted the day. But more recent, uh, they are now estimated to be between 15 or 20 or something. So um, by the time the Norwegian forces uh, surrendered was in June, uh, there was two months. So interestingly enough, the attack on um, when the German army broke through the uh, Adenner and occupied, you know, Holland, Belgium, France, and started in May and was over by June. So the Norwegian uh, fighting, the campaign in Norway lasted longer than the campaign in, in, uh, in uh, continental Europe. Of course, the, the sizes of the armies, there's no comparison. So we, <laughs> it's not because Norwegians are such good soldiers, I think it's more because the country is very well it's, it's a good country to defend in the sense that, you know, you have hundreds of thousands of valleys and places. And it was difficult for many places for the Germans to use planes, <clears throat> which they always used whenever they, the army were held back. And on top of that, um, the, you know, it's, uh, it's the long distances and uh, they didn't have helicopter. You couldn't just move from one valley to the next uh, like you can today. You know, you had to drive or march around and there are no, very few crossroads. I mean, they, they, the, the roads like the rail network, especially in those days, if you were sort of like from Oslo and then out like this, and you kind of had to go back to Oslo <laughs> if you're gonna go from Bergen to, uh, to Trondheim, for example, because you have all these fjords uh, cutting. Now, of course, there's bridges and tunnels and what have you, but uh, that was not around in, uh, in 1940. So, um, so I think Norwegians always took a lot of pride in that 
that, uh, and still do actually, that we managed to hold out with what we had. And as I said, it's an interesting sort of uh, speculation what what could have happened if uh, things had been better uh, prepared. Um, when, the, when the fighting ended, uh, of course, we found ourselves in the occupied country, but thousands had, had escaped, uh, many to Sweden, and of course, tens of thousands followed, uh, some to Britain, some to, you know, the, all these uh, resistance fighters which, or pilots and people who, who were fighting, continue to fight from England. There's a lot of very interesting uh, uh, stories about how they traveled, you know, they went from to Russia to Japan to, I mean, it's all these really fascinating stories. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, eventually the Shetland bus, as many of you uh, know about, started and uh, there was all sorts of ways to escape, but um, it took some time. But of course, the vast majority went to Sweden. Okay, if you go to the next slide. Okay, I did, no, the, the next one, sorry. Uh, I, I, you know, I, go back one, one uh, slide, by the way, I should, next one. Yeah, sorry, my, my fault. Yeah, so these are from uh, top, bottom left is Hegra Fortress. And uh, um, so it's, you can still go and take a look at it today. Part of it has been uh, refurbished. It's not a big fortress sticking out of the ground. It's more a modern way, you know, it's built below ground and that's what saved them. And again, you know, the, the weapons in 1940 were not what they were today. So fixed fortresses still had the place. Top right is uh, Dombos from Dombos, which is uh, kind, kind of a uh, railroad uh, crossing if you're going north or to the to west coast. And uh, the Germans tried to to take that area. They thought the king with it, he was not. But what was there was the Norwegian gold supply or part of it. And they sent in a number of planes and uh, uh, the local commander and the guy who headed the German force, they didn't want to go, but and uh, because they knew the weather was too difficult, the area was very difficult, it was mountainous, uh, no place to land, really difficult. So they, but it became, a, but Hitler gave the order because he wanted to capture the king and, and government. So it became what they call the Führerbefehl or the, the Führer's uh, command. And, you know, you couldn't argue about that, you know. If it was a fear before you had to go. It's, yeah, that, those things happen, of course, uh, also in other armies. But uh, so they, they flew in and uh, the Norwegian uh, soldiers, had, as I said, they had a fair number of machine guns. And when they did, and by that time, of course, this was a bit into it, they were getting more proficient in using them. So they basically used them and they shot down seven of these transports full of soldiers. So it was quite a... Uh, by the standards of that day, you know, a lot of soldiers who, who disappeared, of course, by World War II standards in total, it wasn't too many. All right, now we can go to the last uh, slide. So this, so after the battle, we found ourselves um, occupied and the two, um, there were two, the Germans built two big monuments. The left is from Pelengo, it's uh, in, honor of Pelenga and the 196th Division, as I mentioned, who was the one pursuing the main Norwegian force and the government all the way over to Olsen. So that was the one. And the right one is a memorial for over a thousand German soldiers who fell in, uh, in um, or, or died in Richard. And that was the biggest single loss for the Germans. So, uh, of course, in 1945, they were blown up. So you can't see them today. You might, I think there's some pieces that you can find in museum, but of course, the, those things were immediately blown up after 19, when, when uh, peace came back. So uh, let me just, just take one more thing about the total counting. So what happened? Uh, so how big were the fights? Well. There was a fair number of deaths as a percentage of the soldiers committed. That death rate was actually quite high, both for the Germans, the Allies, and, and the uh, Norwegians. Um, still, there was about 5,000 Allied soldiers, about 1,000 Norwegians. I, did, uh, I think was, uh, I have it here. Um, 
Yeah, so about 800 Norwegian soldiers died in, in the April uh, fighting in April, May, June. Um, so the number of soldiers, I mean, tragic, of course, like always for those who are in war, but in, by World War II standards, you know, there wasn't that many. And the, the loss of equipment for the German army in the overall scheme of things, it was nothing. And the same for the Allies. And also on top of that, uh, a lot of the Allies and especially Norwegian equipment was uh, completely outdated. There was um, out of Norway, six uh, destroyers, like three or four of them managed to escape to England, but two of them is so old. The Germans, uh, the British didn't use them. They used them for a while just to distill water, seawater. <laughs> And uh, but the Sleipner class that we, we saw, those were actually used, they, and the, the Germans captured two of them also. Uh, that had were not finished yet; they were still building them, and they so they were, that was used by both sides. So they were good uh, modern ships. The um, number of ships that went down that was um, again that was no sorry. Let me first uh, take the airplanes. So in airplanes, the, the, well, the Norwegian Air Force lost more or less everything they had. Uh, the Germans lost about 100 planes, uh, the British and French, something similar. So again, you know, in, in by World War II standards, 100 planes is, uh, <laughs> you know, nobody would notice. You, you, in Battle of Britain, they lost a thousand and they still did fight. But, um, of course, you know, still 100 planes is 100 planes. Then the big losses for the Germans, one was there were three things, which I think to me, they made a big mistake by attacking Norway. One was the way they did it was successful. They achieved their, their um, goals, the losses in number of soldiers, army equipment, planes were very small, but the, the losses in ships were quite substantial. And they lost, they had six cruisers, they lost the three of them. Uh, one was sunk by a sub British submarine off Norway. I mentioned Quirin Fortress who damaged, which was that sort of like a combined, both the British and the Norwegians claimed that we, we were the ones who destroyed it. But it, well, you can say it was a joint operation in a way, because um, if Quirin hadn't uh, damaged it, it probably would have been able to, one, use its gun, which it couldn't really do. And second, it might even have moved to another place because it was completely stationary. Uh, and then of course, Blücher. So that was, a, that was basically half or a third of their total cruisers. They, they ended up with nine, they, they had six, but uh, there were some uh, uh, who were almost finished uh, that the joint fight. So they lost a third of their cruisers, the cruisers they had during the whole war actually. And then they had these destroyers. And as I mentioned, they, the German Navy was small and uh, they had a number of smaller destroyers. Uh, they kind of called them torpedo hunters or to, um, it was kind of a combined, they, they, they were really, they were bigger than Norwegian destroyers. So. I think their name was, they called them that was because they were built in the late twenties and uh, you know, Germany was still sort of giving the impression but well, that was before Hitler. So to stay within the Versailles Treaty. Uh, but this, uh, these C-class destroyers were quite important because they were the only sea going, you know, the only destroyers in the German Navy that could operate far from the coast. So they lost half of them and they didn't really build uh, many more during the war. And when you read about uh, this battleship Scharnhorst and, the, and the Bismarck, of course, the two most famous, they sailed alone. Uh, Bismarck had one cruiser. Now, normally they should have sailed with, well, maybe a cruiser, but also a bunch of destroyers to pick off attacking airplanes, you know, being to distract them before they actually reached the battleship, etc. But they couldn't because they were all at the bottom of Norwegian fjords. And of course, if you had 20, you know, a third of them, in a, if they still had had 20, probably a third of them at any given time would be in for refurbishment, which is of course the same today. So uh, that was a significant loss for, uh, for the German Navy. And losing a third of their cruisers and one of the three heaviest cruisers was another one. 
they still had their battleships, but this was before, in, there were only two really in operation in 1940. So the German fleet was crippled. And many people have pointed out, many historians have pointed out that the Battle of Britain even had the, had the Luftwaffe prevailed against the Royal Air Force, they still wouldn't have been able to, to, uh, to invade England. Because if they moved, moved uh, ships into the canal and you would need a lot of ships, you couldn't get away with 5,000 men or something if you wanted to invade England. Um, they would have been, uh, the, the British would have sent in destroyers and cruisers and they had large numbers of them. So um, the, um, this, the, the losses for the German Navy were very substantial. And there was a lot of other ships. I mentioned some of these, uh, there was something like uh, 20 or 30 ships that went down. And actually in my book, I have, I have listed all of them. And it's quite a list of the transports and what have you. So the German Navy after 1940 was, in my view, for, for practical purposes, even though you hear about uh, Bismarck and Tibis, but for all practical purposes, it was a submarine force after the Norwegian campaign. A lot of them have, of course, been not been sunk by Norwegians, but also by the Royal, uh, by the British, as I mentioned. One of the three cruisers was sunk by a submarine. So that was uh, that was a big loss. The second thing was that one of the the uh, there were some of the side effects of the invasion, and one was for the rest of the war, the Germans kept this Norway and Denmark occupied with up to five six hundred thousand troops. And in the hard fought battles in 1941 in, in Russia and then 42 in Russia and also to a certain extent in the Mediterranean, half a million troops could have made a difference. When they started pulling them out towards the end of the war, I think that, that ship was gone because at that stage, you know, the, the Russians had mobilized, you know, millions. The US was in the war and had mobilized millions. The British had, had mobilized uh, their forces. So, uh, 500,000 troops was a big deal in 1940-41 maybe, but it was uh, uh, just sort of a common mistake in the 1944-45. They wouldn't have made any... Uh, and they started pulling out like the 196th Infantry Division, which is the most uh, memorable division. Uh, they were sent to Russia and in a couple of big battles, they were just ground to nothing. So um, yes, they could have done, could have made a difference and prolonged the war or whatever. I don't think the Germans could ever win the war, actually, but not the way they, they managed to antagonize everybody. But um, at least they could, they would have, uh, have prolonged the war and made it bloodier. So it's probably in that sense, it's probably a good thing that they did, uh, at least for the allies. The other thing was, of course, in addition to the troops and the resources spent in Norway, they also, um, they also, uh, um, yes. Yeah, uh, was, sorry, it was regarding the uh, what they gained. So they did gain the bases, which the, the German Navy wanted. But by the time the Norwegian campaign was over, of course, the Battle of France was over. So they, they didn't need the bases to the same extent. Well, once they attacked Russia, they were useful because of their Arctic convoys. But you know, when, when it was too hard to use the Arctic convoys, the Allies, the British and the Americans also sent this the equipment to uh, Iran and other places. And it has to be remembered that the German army in Russia was really beaten before, or not beaten, but it was really damaged before the full effect of the British and the American equipment, uh, you know, all the trucks and food and everything that was sent, which was very important for the Russians. But at that time, when that really took off in 42, 43, 43 and 44, especially, the Germans were already in a, in a retreat. You know, they, they just tried to eat too much. I think it's as simple as that. Um, so, so the bases were not that important because suddenly they had the whole French coastline so they could base the submarine. And that's where most of them were used uh, against the Atlantic convoys, etc. cetera. Uh, the other thing was, uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the uh, uh, iron ore from Sweden. Now, uh, I think it's about 1800 tons. They, uh, they uh, exported out to Sweden every year. Well, in 1940 and 39, before 
the fall of France and the in low countries, and of course, dominating the rest of Eastern Europe also. That that was important for them. You know, they, it wasn't crucial, but it was important. But once they they uh, conquered France and Belgium, they uh, got the, all, all the iron ore from those countries, and that was about fourteen thousand tons. So uh, again, you know, they for the later war years in 41 42 it wasn't it didn't really mean that much now this the they did of course uh, get a lot of iron ore from sweden or especially equipment you know <clears throat> ball bearings and stuff what has to be remembered and, and after the war there was a sort of a and i still remember that very well for, firstly even though i mean of course i was born after the war but uh, with my fa father having been a quite active participant in the Linge company, etc. Um, you know, I, I was, I sort of grew up with it. I and mean, when we went into Oslo my, with my mother shopping or something, she would, oh, you know, this is where that so-and-so happened. For example, there was a, they tried to bomb the Gestapo headquarters in Oslo. <clears throat> One of the bombs missed and hit a trolley which killed a lot of civilians. So my mother would, oh yeah, see, you know, see those marks on the wall? That was that bomb who killed, the, you know, hit that trolley, etc. So it, it was a very live thing for us, uh, just like it was, of course, for some of you with your parents, etc. And seeing, you know, and, and if you go to Oslo, if you go to Akershus Castle, you can find a, right there, there's a beautiful little area there where you, most of this, uh, or at least, um, not most, but a lot of these uh, uh, resistant fighters and, captured people where were executed. It's quite a somber area, actually. It's a very nice little inscription here also. So um, so there, there was this feeling that, oh, Sweden betrayed us. But I, I really don't. First of all, we didn't do much when the Russians attacked Finland. So uh, the Finns could probably feel the same about all of Scandinavia. Um, the, the second was that. Um, the, 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 the Swedes wouldn't have had a chance against the German army. Um, they had 55 fighter planes, the same as we had, uh, the Gloucester Gladiator. And on top of that, they gave about almost half of their ammunition and everything else to the, uh, to the Finns in the 1940 battle, 39-40 battle against, uh, you know, the Winter War, as it's known. So I, I think it's a little bit unfair. And it was very good for the Norwegians later in the war that people who were wanted for whatever could escape to, uh, to, to Sweden, which was much easier. Now, my dad was wanted for what they called anti-German activities. Uh, he was a, you know, high school and in the high school. And well, he hadn't started college yet, but he was going to. So, um, <laughs> You wouldn't be executed for that, but you would probably end up in a labor camp or something. So um, he he got away and he went. To, he, he was already had already been sent. He had been expelled from school for his anti-German activities. So he uh, had was working at a farm that somebody knew, and then he managed to get over to England. So he was very interested in in all these things. And so for me and. Um, Everybody else, it was a big thing. And this discussion about Sweden's role was, was very big. But I think it was actually very lucky, both for Norway and, uh, and Denmark, that Sweden remained neutral. And they were in a difficult position because, I, as I said, I, there's no doubt in my mind, and I don't think in many minds, that they would not have been able to, uh, to withstand, uh, to, to go against the German army. They wouldn't have been able to. If all of Scandinavia had been united in 1940, if we had had a which I think would have been a wonderful thing if we had a united Scandinavia. It didn't have to be a single country, but sort of like a NATO, the North. <laughs> if something like that had existed, I think the Germans and also the, the Russians would have been much more reluctant. And actually Putin said so much. He said that uh, Putin mentioned in a, uh, that it was a good thing for Russia that uh, uh, countries in Scandinavia uh, did so much fighting between themselves, which is, of course, what we did until 1814. So uh, and that allowed the growth of uh, Russia and then, of course, also Norway and Denmark to be occupied. So anyway, this was pretty much it. Uh, I had to go a little bit fast here, obviously, um, not to spend too much time. I hope it's I didn't spend 
too much time. I don't know exactly uh, how much you planned for Bill, but uh, I'm certainly happy to take questions and uh, comments or whatever. Okay. Uh, remember to unmute yourself and uh, wonder if uh, I have some questions, but I want to see if uh, other people have questions. Yeah, I have a question. So I'm really curious about the maps. Um, my, uh, the fact that F Falkenhorst had a map, uh, my understanding is all that was available was the Batiker from like uh, 1926. So the thing that I got excited about, because uh, I could check it out in my library, I have the British Naval uh, book that was published okay. in 1942. And my understanding is especially when they were, you know, south of Trondheim, they're really, the, I didn't know the Polish and the French were there years ago. And when I discovered that, it's like no one in the United States knows that story that the Allies actually went in. But the problem was that they didn't have good maps. And this is the reason why this is the first book and the two volume book of this uh, thing. The maps are amazing and you can just look, oh yeah, oh, that's so-and-so. In fact, when I went to Trondheim three years ago, I, I knew that map so well that when I was walking with my hostess, I pointed out the brewery and she said, how'd you know that? And I was going, oh, 1946, 42 map, you know. But how, what kind of map did Falkenhurst have? It was a, tra it was a travel map. It was a, a tourist map, so it was very general. Like a batter, um, the beer? Yes, uh, it's, um, what is the name we get? I have it in my... Uh, Make the I, I looked it up online and it, uh, it doesn't go any further north than Oslo, maybe Bergen, but it doesn't go any further. It's just this little jaunt through Norway, yeah. published in 1926. Uh, the, yeah, it, it was it was um, a tourist map, so it was obviously not too, uh, and I don't know if it uh, covered Northern Norway, I've never seen that comment on it, mm -hmm. um, but it was, um, I, I, and of course, you know, the whole German operation was very daring, uh, they had not put an awful lot of planning, they did of course, he did, he did a very good job, I mean, militarily seen Falkenhorst. but um, of course they went in with a lot of shortcomings, and I think, uh, I don't think better maps would necessarily have made a big difference. I think one, again, if they had uh, done a little bit more uh, spying and reconnaissance, so they had known, for example, about the torpedo batteries and realized that uh, sailing past Oskarsborg, you can't miss if you have a torpedo there. And you can't hide because it's too short. I don't care how thick the fog is, it would have to be like made of bricks so if you couldn't see a big ship. So uh, so I think that was the biggest mistakes. They made some of these. They didn't really have time to uh, reconnaissance, do any reconnaissance. And they, they sent some of their people, you know, they traveled very openly to Norway. And before the invasion, they ordered the German army, of course, they probably didn't order it in the name of the army, but they ordered a lot of room at the KNA hotel in Oslo. So certainly they had all this influx. So orders from Germany for uh, for rooms. <laughs> and that was, of course, where the German uh, staff uh, uh, moved in when they came to, to Norway, when they come to Oslo. One of the rumors, too, when I was doing early research years ago was about the Vienna orphans, the German kids, they were adopted by Norwegian family. I think there's always a rumor that they had, you know, they turned around and went against their adoptive parents. Is there any truth to that? I've never heard about that. I don't know. I'm not really. Um, they, they, I haven't really heard about that. What there has been a discussion about in Norway, <clears throat> or was a big discussion about going a few years back now, of course, most of people from World War II are dead, but uh, was the treatment of some of these girls uh, or women who had gone out with German soldiers. Um, you know, and, and how they, especially the ones who had ended up pregnant, uh, they were pretty much sent to Germany. And of course, half, half of them probably found out that the guy they had gone out with was already married. And of course, moving to Germany in 1945, I mean, moving from Norway to the US, I could see because you moved from a pretty war-torn country, especially Northern Norway. Southern part of Norway wasn't that touched. There, was, there were things that happened, but by and large, you know, the infrastructure was uh, intact. In Northern Norway, it's opposite. I mean, if you see build pictures from Hammerfest, all you see is some chimneys sticking up. 
So I can see then, you know, in a situation like that, that moving to a place like the US or some other place would be very tempting. Moving to Germany in 1945, that must have been. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a, it was a very bad, uh, and, and Norway sort of officially, as they always say, apologized for the treatment of these women because mm -hmm. most of them had just gone out. You know, they wasn't like they had joined the Nazi party or anything like that. And of course, a lot of these guys were, uh, were decent guys. Most of them, actually, by and large, they, they behaved reasonably well. They, I think the German soldiers uh, behaved well. Of course, there were some of these Gestapo types and some of these Norwegian collaborators who committed uh, atrocities. But uh, and of course, they they were also the ones who sent the the, the Jews who didn't get away to to the German uh, camps and resistance fighters and what have you. I I have a question on the uh, surrender of the Norwegian army. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm first first generation here, but uh, my 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 father left Norway in the '30s, so he, all his brothers uh, were in Norway during the war. But uh, after the war, uh, they communicated again, and uh, he asked them uh, what what because they were all in the reserve, so there was conscription and everything. And he asked them, he says, uh, "What happened after Norway surrendered?" And uh, three of his brothers. They wrote back, we didn't have computers then. They wrote back and said, their, their commander told them um, to go home, take off the uniforms yeah. and go home. Is that right? Yes, that's very much uh, true. And the Germans actually, even the ones who were captured, the Germans, uh, they just had to sign a paper that they would not fight against the Germans army again. And then they were allowed to go. So like a lot of the sailors, and one of the most famous Norwegian naval officers from the time, he was one of those, because what he said was, I, I, don't, I didn't consider that a binding document, he said, because I was forced to, I didn't have much choice. So he just did that and took off to England. Yeah, but, that is, but that is correct what you said. That's, that's what happened in many cases. And yeah, well, it seems that the, uh, maybe the, the soldiers didn't, for, from my understanding, the commanding officer signed for his unit. I guess it wasn't. Yeah, that, that, could be, that could be. Yeah. That, that was, I would guess also, and, and I'm not certain about this, but I would guess it probably depend a little bit on the circumstances because in southern Norway, like the naval person, there, there were not that many. But of course, in, in northern Norway, when the army surrendered, the, the, there was something like 16,000 Norwegian soldiers in northern Norway. So, of course, I can see that maybe they didn't want to spend time on having every one of them sign yeah. the, uh, the unit. Too, that, that would be, I'm not certain. Yeah, too much red tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. But uh, in, in um, there's, there's quite a few of these war memoirs where they mentioned that, that, you know, they had just had to sign and then they were allowed to go home uh, a month or so after the fighting stopped. Just and talk. Very ugly. Hey, sir, uh, excellent presentation. I have a question for you. Um, if you take the ferry out of Stavanger and head up to Bergen, right before you come into Bergen, there's a large rock cliff there on the, the right side, the east side as you're coming in. And in that rock cliff, there are two cutouts into it that look like you could back rather large ships and maybe a submarine. And I was wondering, do you have any historical information on that? Was that World War II? Was it post-World War II? Is it something that the Germans would have used? To, uh, to back submarines in to keep them from being aerial attack or anything like that, over? Yeah, the, uh, I'm not certain about that particular one, but there were very few, there, there were not really any, any, let's say hidden harbors or mountain harbors in, in the Norway in 1940. The Germans built some and they built one in, in Trondheim, for example. And, you know, some of these structures are like the one in France, you know, they can't take it down. You can, just can't get, because if you built a bomb strong enough to demolish that submarine pen, um, you would probably create chaos in the whole city. And uh, that's the same in some of these places. Now, the, some of them are in more remote areas and you could do something about it. But uh, yeah, no, that, that was probably either built by the Germans and a lot of these coastal forts, fortresses in Norway were actually also built by Germans, not the ones I mentioned today, of course. And uh, took, we took them over in 1945 and uh, used them until, uh, I think the start was in the 1980s when, uh, when the smart bombs, as I said, and all these modern weapons made them uh, 
um, yeah, plus they're expensive to maintain also and dubious value in the, in the modern uh, warfare. But so my guess is they were built either by I, they were they may have been built by uh, by the Germans. I know there are some big. Uh, there is at least one big submarine base that was built there, so it may very well be that one. Do you have any idea roughly how many civilians were killed in the initial invasions, and then also, you know, throughout the five years of the occupation, how many? Um, well, uh, the uh, yes, uh, it's a quick answer. There was about uh, 400 civilians and 800 soldiers who died, Norwegian soldiers that died in the uh, 1940 battles. Uh, during uh, the uh, whole war, something like 10,000 Norwegians lost their fight uh, and uh, lost their lives in the fight. and. Uh, it's interesting enough, actually, if you take it by 50, because the US population is about 50 times Norwegian, you, you, it's almost like percentage-wise the same number of people that, uh, that the US lost. So, uh, so, the, um, so the number of people were, because Norway is a small nation, but as a sort of impact on society, it was similar in the sense that everybody knew somebody, you know, may, maybe them lost their, a close relative, but they knew somebody who had died or, or whatever. And of course, um, it's the whole invasion also changed Norway forever. And um, after the war, as is the case in most countries, there's a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the after the war, the uh, number of German deads, uh, Germans killed in the in the 1940 battles were widely ex wildly exaggerated, because and and. Um, I think that's always, you know, now that it's further away and uh, most of us, of course, have been born after, well, almost everybody's been born after. Uh, it's different. We've been more, uh, more realistic. And I mentioned that thing about the women and, and my dad was um, like most little boys, of course, I grew up admiring my dad uh, enormously. And um, uh, I still remember, and I may have mentioned this, I think I mentioned this last time also, and we talked, it had a little bit wider uh, thing. I, I was reading um, one of my first history classes, I'm sure I was still at elementary school and must have been one of the first three years because I remember it was in the, we moved in when I was in fourth grade and it was not in the new house. And I was reading it and uh, my dad was sort of, oh, you know, let me see, he's sort of reading over my shoulder. And he said, Jürgen, that's not the way it was, he said. And I was like, well, well what do you mean? <laughs> he said, no, that's, what they say here is not right. He said, it wasn't so that all the good guys sided with the allies and all the criminals and drunks and whatever have you, I mean, all the dreadful society uh, sided with the Germans. So he said, it were good and bad on both sides. And I, so I thought that uh, for the time that was, now, of course, a few years later, actually in the seventies, that became much more common to hear. But in, in the sixties, that was still, uh, but I think a lot of the guys who had done something and, and my dad uh, uh, didn't have to sort of pretend to be patriotic because he had, you know, he had escaped to England, he had been landed in Norway and this and that. Uh, because we see that resistance fight, you know, if you look at the numbers of people who signed up for the, signed up for the resistance, it increased tremendously in 44 and 45. And uh, everybody realized what was how the ending was going to be because you know most people, of course, except for super convinced Nazis, I think by 1944, I think they knew the this, this train was heading for a for a big crash. And uh, yeah, so it, it was it was a very black and white. So I kind of had that from the 60s when it was very black and white, and then the 70s and 80s and 90s. It, became a more realistic view of the, both of the fighting and the sacrifices and also the, the, the division because, and I think now living in the US and, and living in a country that's, has, um, if, you, if you haven't experienced an occupation, and of course I have not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been free as long as I've been there, but I, I think it's very easy to create this sort of movie characters, you know, oh, it's so, you know, oh, we will kick ass and, you know, we'll do this and we hide out. And, but it's not that easy. And again, I think my family is, is a good example. So my dad escaped from England. Now, 
my dad was the oldest of three and two sisters and his father and you know his parents and the two sisters were still there and what the germans did um was to to stop all this uh, railway uh, sabotage etc was they would basically say, say you know and his name was simon my my grandfather he said simon you have this stretch of the rail line you know and if there's any sabotage on that stretch while you're on duty you will have to answer and so you can say oh well if you're 20 and single that wouldn't be much of a threat because you could just take off with the guys and run over to sweden or whatever but my grandfather of course couldn't do that he had two young girls and he had a wife and uh, um, who knows what would have happened to them um so uh I, I think in, in as with all wars, you know, and, and we see that today also, it's when you have it a little bit, create a little bit distance, you get more realistic. And I think that uh, it's easy to criticize some of these countries where uh, that were occupied. But um, I think when you when you look at it more realistically today, you, you have a different, uh, you can see why a lot of people, the majority of course, are fence sitters, you know, as I said, you, you, it's not that easy to to uh, take up a fight against uh, when you don't know what, how, how it will end, and uh, you also don't know what will this do to your family. You know, what will it do to your kids? What will it do to your wife? You know, they suddenly will they find themselves on a train to a concentration camp or a labor labor camp? Uh, so, um, yeah. so it wasn't really a simple decision, yeah. You know, to uh, yeah, no, that's it's complicated yeah. because you have the family and things like that. Yeah, you know. it's much easier on the movie where you can yes. be heroic with <laughs> with no yeah. consequences. Right. Uh, one, uh, what if? I, I I have a life of what if, but I think one of the key what ifs if the United States hadn't been involved in World War II, how that would have affected things. You mean in 1940? In 1941, if if say for example. For some reason, Japan had never attacked the United States. Uh, it's hard to see them not, not eventually getting in, but uh, that, that's an interesting question. And uh, I believe that if what happened in 1940 and 39 had continued beyond uh, December 1941, I still think Germany would have lost. But I think we would be speaking Russian. <laughs> because yeah. there's no way uh, Germany could have won, and they maybe they could have gotten a peace agreement. That that could have happened, you know, because uh, in 1943, of course, Stalin was uh, 42, 43. Stalin was there was some negotiation, secret negotiations between Germany and and Russia, but uh, Hitler wanted more of Russia than uh, Stalin was willing to give up. Now. If that had not happened, no peace agreement. If there had been a peace agreement, of course, I I don't think uh, Britain by, by itself could not have beaten Germany. I think that's quite clear, you know, especially yeah. when Germany had all the resources of the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, for the US to launch an attack on Europe, well, once you have nuclear bombs, it's a different kind of attack, but let's leave that aside because that came of course, several years later, but in the intervening period, how, how would they have, they wouldn't have enough aircraft carriers to sail across the day for Japan. But remember, Japan was militarily much weaker than, than, uh, than Germany. Mm -hmm. If you look at the airplane losses, for example, Germany was fighting Britain and Britain had as many planes as Germans, the Russians and the US Air Force in the air. And despite the fact that um, that so they uh, they were fighting three, the, the U.S. Air Force lost many more planes in Europe than they did in uh, the Pacific. Mm -hmm. The, the um, if you look at the airplane losses by itself, now I know this is kind of like an easy uh, statistic which you should be very careful about, but but it's still it's still if you look at the total losses of airplanes, it's vastly more. So the so the, Ger the German economy was much more uh, efficient in 1940 than the Japanese was. That may be different in this 
10 years ago, but back in those days it were. And of course the Germans had the technologic, technological edge in airplanes. Now they didn't, you had Mustang and all these uh, fantastic planes that came from the US, but remember the big, big risk, one, if the Germans had managed to manufacture their, uh, their uh, uh, jet fighters, the Messerschmitt 262, unhindered by all this fighting, mm-hmm. the Mustang would have had a heck of a time. Yeah. So, um, because it, it would have been outflown, but um, so it, it's a it's a kind of a, and I, I enjoy those kind of uh, mm-hmm. um, what if scenarios. But uh, I, I think it would have been uh, we we would uh, Scandinavia would either be speaking German or Russian today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's yeah, it, it's fun, but it, there's always a limitation. Yeah. Any any other question regarding the. I have one. When you were talking about your um, uh, studies and how you, it was somewhat skewed when it came to the war, were you guys in Norway taught about the Liebensborn, Himmler's Liebensborn program and those uh, the women who, was that yeah. something you were taught? or Because a lot of people that I've talked to from Norway about it, they seem rather surprised. Yeah. It wasn't a big thing in Norway. And the reason, because of course, like most countries in Norway and the US, and we're all the same in that way. We, we, we learn about our own history and then we learn about everybody else. Mm-hmm. And Lebensborn wasn't such a big thing, you know, because they consider us racial brothers, you know, Norwegians were Aryans. And uh, so, th- which was part of the reason, of course, they behaved much better uh, in Norway than they did in uh, in many other countries because they didn't see us as uh, untermenschen and all these uh, things, you know. So, um, uh, Lebensborn, you heard about it, and you know anybody who's interested in history knows about it. But it wasn't a big thing. I, I, I'm sure we, I didn't hear about it back in the '60s and, and '70s. Maybe today, but. I have a question on uh, maybe the, the contribution uh, from this side of uh, uh, the Atlantic uh, between uh, Norwegian uh, born and Norwegian Americans during World War II. Uh, I know that uh, being brought up in Berlin, Brooklyn, that hundreds, hundreds of uh, young men went up to Canada yeah. during the, the Norwegian Air Force. And, and then um, there were a lot of Norwegians here, including my father, who uh, went back to sea and the North Skids are hunting flock there. It's, uh, it's... Yeah, it's, that's, that's... And a woman's body, and that's why this... Oh, so yeah. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, that, that's little Norway. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mo- most of the pilots, etc., that came, came from England, actually. I mean, there were Norwegians who escaped to England and then to there. And in addition, uh, of course, there were some from, from um, the U.S., uh, the other thing that uh, was helpful, of course, was that there was a, a lot of donations among the Norwegian Americans. So yeah. they played, they paid for some of the planes. And some of the planes had actually been brought, had been bought. Some of the planes that I showed in the beginning that uh, we would have liked, would have been great to have in 1940, they were actually delivered to the Canadian uh, uh, training base. But when they came to the fighting, they didn't use them. First of all, by the time they were ready to field those fighter planes, we were talking close to 42, and they were already, they were, would have been useful in 1940. Two years later, they were, they were only good for, for training planes. And the other thing was that when they tried to use them, they were also afraid that if they introduced planes that looked different from, let's say, Spitfires and Hurricanes, there would be mistakes. And so the only one that was used in, in the first part was these um, anti-submarine planes, the Northrop. It was actually Northrop's first uh, plane. I didn't have a picture of it, but um, it's called the N3PB, a patrol bomber. And that was, uh, would have, again, would have been a great dead order 24 of them, would have been great in Norwegian fjords. So they decided to use them from, from um, Iceland. So the first Norwegian squadron in 1941 was set up in Iceland with these planes. The problem but again was- They also had the Catalinas because- I, Yeah, they um, came later. They yeah, came okay. later, yeah. Okay. yeah, uh, yeah. They came in 42, 43, that's when, but in 41 and uh, 40, beginning of 42, they started changing them. They only had the entry PB. And um, they, even, even then being so far away, one, one of them was shot down. 
by a U.S. destroyer, <laughs> uh, obviously by mistake, but because you know they say we don't have any plane like that, right? They expected a Catalina or some of those big uh, British um, planes like the Sunderland, and here comes this one-engine fighter. Now you can say that if they had been uh, thinking about it, they would have realized it. There's no single engine fighter could have flown so far out. But of course, if you're at the ship and you're afraid of being attacked, you shoot just to be certain. So that plane was, uh, fortunately the crew survived, but uh, it was uh, the only one that was shot down actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but they were used there and uh, they were not, they, they did a useful job, but they were not really built for that kind of uh, anti-submarine and anti-warship warfare because they were built for narrow fjords and coastal areas. And here you are in the middle of an ocean. And remember the planes in those days were not as reliable as they are today. So to have a crew of two or three and uh, 2,000 pound bombs and uh, um, looking for a submarine or uh, mostly submarine, uh, the German surface ships didn't really go that far out. Um, yeah, you you <laughs> you don't want to be too much battle because you get one punctured uh, gasoline tank and uh, <laughs> that's a heck of a swim in uh, freezing cold waters. So um, it's not, it's not yeah. good. No, and few oh. survived that actually. <laughs> One question is uh, one of the main effects of the um, uh, Norwegian resistance is that the merchant marine, the Norwegian mer merchant marine, which was one of the largest in the world, was put in the service of the Allied yeah. causes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? That's that's correct. And actually, I, f I was that was the one thing I forgot when I was talking earlier. The other thing that the, the Germans accomplished by that was that the Norwegian merchant marine almost to to down to the man went into allied service. Whereas, of course, if they had not done that, it would have been well. They, in World War One, Norway was not part, but the merchant marine sailed for the allies. Most of it, but of course, in World War Two, almost all of it, except the ships that were in Norway. Uh, so which the Germans got hold of, but that was, you know, that was the smaller ship. So, so the, and for example, in 1940, during the Battle of Britain, it's, it's an interesting fact that I think it was about 40% of all the gasoline used by the Royal Air Force came on Norwegian oil tankers. So mm -hmm. that was a big, big contribution. And that was probably Norway's, when it comes to, as I said, the, the one is the sort of the passive contribution that the Germans kept hundreds of thousands of people I think at the peak, there was over 400,000 German soldiers in Norway garrisoning them and looking after the country of 4 million, you know, which wasn't why they were there. They because Hitler thought they would attack Germany through Norway. I don't know how anybody could think that, but anyway, that's what he thought. Um, and the other big contribution, and that was the active contribution, was uh, the, um, the uh, merchant marine. Of course, you had all the resistance fighters. You had the uh, Air Force. They had three two Spitfire squadrons and so on. But I think in the big scheme of things, when you look at the number of British and American, of course, if you go to the outside Russian squadrons and ships, those were quite, quite, uh, quite few. So it was important for the morale for the Norwegian forces. And, and they did a good job. You know, uh, in 1943, the top scoring fighter squadron in, uh, in uh, fighter command was actually a Norwegian squadron, 31 mm -hmm. squadron with Spitfires. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they did a good job, but in the big scheme of things, you know, yeah, uh, the British had 10,000 10, uh, uh, aircraft in the RF and Norway had uh, maybe 150. So, uh, but, you know, it was important, but the merchant marine was extremely important for the allies and, and was, uh, uh, I think it was, um, it was Churchill who said in one of his speeches that, uh, the Norwegian merchant marine is worth a, worth a million man army. So that was how important he saw that with the supplies coming in. And speaking of the merchant marine, I will just remind you that next month's uh, talk is going to be on the merchant marine. And uh, Phil, if you could, uh, Phil will be one of the speakers next month. And okay. if you want to talk a, briefly, Phil, about the talk that's coming up next month. Or not? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Can't hear you. You're muted. Oh. Okay. <laughs>
Sorry, I'm uh, uh, sorry. Well, Phil, um, yeah, Phil, and uh, we're also I have uh, several people talking. Uh, Phil's father was in the Merchant Marine, and uh, he gave a very nice talk at the um, uh, 75th anniversary celebration. And this will be a little bit longer talk, uh, so we're looking for Phil. Looking forward to Phil's talk. Um, uh, that's great. Next month. Sorry, you didn't. I'm not hearing you, but we'll work that out uh, by then. Okay. Um, and uh, just another uh, question, uh, Jorgen. Um, now, in 1939, the war started. September. Uh, was Norway hoping not to be a participant? Yeah, I, I think that's. Uh... That was the big thing, in, not only for Norway, but all Scandinavia thought that, like in World War One, we're going to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, very optimistic, of course, but um, <clears throat> of course, hindsight is 2020, as we all know. And yeah. so it may, it, there may have been some risk for it, but of course, they started realizing before that in 37, 38. But as I, as I mentioned again, the, the rearming at that stage, it was very difficult to get equipment. They wanted to buy hurricane fighters was the first, but of course the British needed every hurricane they could build. Mm -hmm. They ended up with the Curtis, which would have been good, but you know, unfortunately it was still in boxes when, uh, when the Germans struck. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, it's uh, once the war started, the, the yes, the German, uh, the British weren't about to sell any, any plane they could have. Yeah. They only sold the uh, gladiators, and Norway bought the gladiator. Uh, uh, Sweden bought it. They gave 20 or their 55 or something like that to, to the Finns. Mm -hmm. And actually, in my book, I also talk a little about the Winter War, because that was, of course, a big wake up call for all of Scandinavia. Uh, the Danes bought, and the Danes bought from Holland because they were willing to sell fighters. But, uh, only uh, 12 of them had arrived and uh, of course it's and they were more modern than uh, they were not as good as the German planes the Messerschmitt but uh, it was still a good better fighter than the uh, than the gladiator but you know Denmark is small and they did something which uh, a lot of countries have made mistake you know it's cheaper to keep all the planes in one base and and he have all good reason and Hawaii of course in uh, December 7 was the same the planes were lumped together because you know you, it was easy to protect against sabotage etc but um, it's easy in with hindsight to say well that's the wrong answer because a sabotage if it hit one base we'd maybe have lost let's say three of planes but now with one bomb raid it knocked out all 12. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the same with the Norway. I mean, there was one, one day of battles and of course uh, that was it. And the whole Air Force was knocked out because there were too few. And they did the same with the bombers, as I said. And there's a very funny, again, today we can laugh, um, story from 1938. And uh, there were still a lot of people, a lot of parts of society, which one had no idea what the modern war, war would entail. And, and of course that was in many countries. Um, and secondly, what we've done. So they write this, when we bought this four or traded these four Italian bombers for this uh, codfish. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, one of the labor, one of the more left-leaning newspapers uh, said that, well, now we, can be, uh, now we can sleep safe in the knowledge that uh, we can have one plane in northern Norway to protect northern Norway and one on the in Trondheim to protect Norway, uh, cent, um, central Norway, and then one on the east coast and one in Oslo. So I uh, one bomber, which of course we all know is nonsense, but yeah. that shows how out of tune people were with, with what the modern war was going to be. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, but uh, one thing I uh, just quickly is that like, in World War II, I mean, you had these very, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, trench warfare where you would go for months with only uh, yards uh, dividing. And then in uh, World War II, you had the Blitzkrieg. Um, uh, and how many weeks did it take for Germany to conquer France? I mean, it's like six weeks. You know, and I mean, it was a different, really completely different war. And I think that took a lot of people by surprise.
And that's, of course, also why Norway managed it. It took much longer because Norway wasn't that... You could roll through France and take all the big cities. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and same with Denmark, of course, in a fairly short time. But the problem for the Germans fighting in Norway was that uh, they had to cross the waters one way or another. Now they could do it in planes, and that's what they did to a certain extent. But, of course, uh, the planes of those days, you know, you, you, something like a Ju-52 could be, I think, 15 soldiers so even if the, and the germans had uh, allocated about 1000 planes for the norwegian campaign and about 58 ships and um, it was actually the f- world's first combined air land navy operation and uh, they it worked very well they 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 had good cooperation whereas for example um, general out Aukenlek, who became f- more famous during the uh, uh, desert fighting <clears throat> he was he evaluated the performance of the uh, allied forces in uh, in uh, northern norway and the germans did the same and his report was so damning that it was uh, kept secret for many many years after the war because not only did did there was a very poor cooperation between the allies and that also means the norwegians and they also had very poor communication between the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy, and the Army. So it was a complete, uh, everybody woke up and it uh, became very clear to the British uh, chiefs of staff that if they were going to fight a war against Germany, they, would, they had to get their act together fast. Mm-hmm. And uh, the German, uh, the German uh, post-operation reports are also quite interesting because they're... Um, they are very complimentary on the Norwegian soldiers, individual mm. soldiers. They, they were the only ones who could use skis to any extent. Mm. Uh, which were, and they were also, um, they were in, in uh, well, even today, but especially before the war, there was all these uh, shooting clubs, sort of like the NRA uh, group where people went. And that was, because hunting has always been big in Norway. And that was very big before the war. So the, the soldiers were very good shots. And then the Germans actually, co- uh, commented on that, that the Norwegian soldiers were extremely good uh, at shooting. But the one thing where they really damned the Norwegian army was uh, their cooperation. And again, that, as I said, there had never been any, there hadn't been any combined uh, drills or any maneuvers or war games in uh, for almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. And just had one or two, but you know, when I was in the army in Norway, and I was I was a drafted. We were all drafted until fairly recently. Actually, in theory, people still are. But today, if you say you don't like green, you can probably get out um, <laughs> because they don't need that. You know, this, the mass army time is past. But uh, uh, we had maneuvers. You know, against the Royal Marines and the U.S. Marines uh, every winter. You know, they had that and. We had, of course, other maneuvers in, in the southern Norway, and uh, so train. So our level of training, compared to what they had in 1940, was phenomenal. And um, we still, of course, used some of these uh, days. Well, the barracks uh, we stayed in was, was still from German times. You know, this was around 1970, so uh, 71, 72. So. Um, uh, they were torn down not long afterwards, but uh, <laughs> at least I got to sleep in a German barrack uh, mm-hmm. the way the German soldiers had been sleeping. Okay, well, so. thank you very much. Uh, I did want to ask Janet, how's uh, the uh, audiobook coming? If you want to uh, keep us informed, Janet is, uh, did a very good book on World War II, The Jostling Affair, and it's coming out as an auto, audio version. Janet, did you want to uh, keep us updated on how that's coming along? Well, I'm really excited because it's done and we have it on a few sites right now. I'm kind of hassling with audio, but uh, I have a wonderful narrator. Chris uh, Humphrey's mother was in the Norwegian resistance and uh, she's, uh, it's an amazing story. Her, uh, his, they both live in Canada. He lives north of me. I'm just south of British Columbia but uh, he did an incredible job. And it's now out on Chirp, I think, Google, Kobo, and a couple of others. But as far as Audible, it's not ready yet. And I really appreciate the lodge. I just joined last night. 
good. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. So uh, the lodge really helped me with it. I'm waiting for the codes that I'll get from Find A Way, and then I can uh, give them out to the people who supported me uh, in the lodge. But I'm really excited. And the fun part is that Chris's parents, his parents were very well-known theatrical people in Oslo. And uh, his mother ended up working for one of the huge uh, shipping com companies. And she has this wild story of going to New York and then London. And she ended up meeting Chris's father, who is an RAF pilot. So uh, he said they never really spoke Norwegian in the home. They moved to Canada after the war. I think he was about one. And uh, so he has been talking to his cousins in Norway to make sure the pronunciation was correct. And then I found out he was on Duolingo like me learning Norwegian. So <laughs> it's been fun. He's, he's a wonderful, he's an actor and he's acted out the story. So I'm just thrilled. That's and right. I appreciate all your help with it. So it's, I'm excited. Okay, well, thank you and welcome to the Lodge. And uh, um... uh, just one thing, um, if any of you are interested or, or have some questions or anything, uh, uh, do you have my email and telephone number, Bill? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, so it, I didn't, maybe it wasn't that thing, yeah. yeah. So by all means, send me an email if you have any questions or sure. give me a call or whatever. It's always fun yeah. to talk about books. I, I will, so. Yeah, I'll put that out in the, the uh, newsletter. Also, um, we wanted this to be a round table. So if you guys want to contribute articles to our newsletter, round tables newsletter, please do it or the website. And if people have ideas for programs, or if you see a good book, or a good presentation, please tell me I'd like to include it. I like to get ideas from everybody. So uh, good talk. Uh, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. I think everybody learned a lot from it. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to um, uh, Phil's and others talk in another month. So uh, thank you very much.